So what do you do to rest? What do you do when you're just like, you're, you're emotionally exhausted, you're physically exhausted, what do you do to rest? Is it uh, go inside and, and just lay on the bed, get on the couch, turn something on? Do you go outside, is that your peaceful place, and go do some work in the yard? Do you go uh, participate in a hobby? You know, I, uh, sometimes I go and play basketball. A couple times a week I go, and that's just to kind of relax and, and, and to drown out everything else. And I, and I call that rest, even though my body doesn't, but I call that rest. But what is it for you? Well, today we're not talking about when you're, you're physically exhausted from doing work or, or, or you're mentally exhausted from uh, what you've done on your job or with family, getting rest there. We're talking about spiritual rest. We're talking about something that God gives us that we can't get anywhere else. And so today as we talk about the resting place, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 11. If you want to turn there in your Bibles, we'll be in just a few verses. We're only talking about three verses today. And I know you're thinking, that means Jeff will go short. No, it doesn't. It just means I finally get to spend enough time on these verses. So in Matthew eleven twenty 28 through 30, let me set up what's going on here. Uh, Jesus is talking, and, and he's telling uh, those who have been working hard to work their way back to God. They've been trying to do this, 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 this in order to be right with God. See, God set up some standards in the Old Testament, but the religious leaders came in and they started throwing all kinds of additions into that to where you can't do this, you can't do this, you got to do this, you got to do this. So, so, so the Israelites, they're sitting there and they're trying to be okay with God, working their way back to God, and, and they got to make sure they eat the right thing. They got to make sure they walk the right way. They got to make sure they don't go an extra step on a certain day, all these things. And so Jesus comes to this part in the text, in chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. And he says this, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is talking to those who have just been working so hard to try to be okay with God. And he's saying, come to me. The first thing he says, here's this invitation for them and for us. The invitation from Jesus, right? He sends that out. He's given it to everybody. And he says, come to me. Come to me. I am the answer. Uh, you're weary and burdened. I am the answer that you need. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, all who are trying to make it back to God, all who want a relationship with God. Uh, all these external things, they're not working for you. Uh, they, they've really been tiresome and they've burdened you. And, and so now come to me. Now there's legalism here with these religious leaders, right? Legalism is where you're told that in order to be okay by God, you got to do this and not do this you got to do this and not do this, right? And some of us may have experienced legalism growing up, or maybe your parents did, or maybe you've heard about it. It used to be, people would say, even in our country not too long ago, uh, that if you're a Christian, you can't dance, right? Which is ironic, because Jesus danced at festivals and weddings and all that, but that's another story. Well, if you're, a Jesus, if you're a Christian, you're a Jesus follower, you can't have anything to drink, now, there are some things that we got to be careful of and, and not get drunk, and if we struggle with it, then not do it, but Jesus drank wine, right? Or, or if, if you're following Jesus, you can't play cards, right? That's, a, that's one that was out there. There's all these legalism things that throughout the course of Christianity in, in America that has done the same thing that is going on back here in Jesus' time, where people are saying, you got to do this, 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 this in order to be okay with God. And Jesus is saying, come to me, not to the rules, but come to the relationship. Come to me. I want to have a relationship with you. And he was talking about this corrupted plan that man had made, uh, thinking that they can work into the favor of God. And, and there's a lot of religions and a lot of people who call themselves Christians who still work this way. Uh, there's, a, there's a big group of people who call themselves Christians who, who it's based on works, what you do in order to get back in relationship with God. But that's not how God works. And Jesus came and gave a different way to get to God. Martin Luther, the great reformer, back in 1510, he was a monk and, and he went on this pilgrimage to Rome. And in Rome, he went and he did something that uh, all good Catholics at the time would do. And he went and he was trying to climb the stairs called Scala Sancta, the holy stairs, uh, on his knees, praying an Our Father at every step in order to release one person from purgatory. 
And so as Martin Luther is doing that, and, and you may say, what's purgatory? Well, it's a, it's a doctrine in, in church that says there's this place where you go after you die, and, and if enough people love you and give enough money to the church and do enough things, then you'll get released from there to go to heaven. Here's two things. I'm not going to go all off on this, but two things about purgatory um, that we need to know. It's not in the Bible. Okay, that's first and foremost. It's not there. It's a made up, made up uh, a doctrine in the 1200s. And number two, purgatory is uh, minimalizing what Jesus did on the cross because it's saying Jesus wasn't enough. And so you'll need Jesus plus people doing stuff for you once you die. Okay, so anyway, back to our story. So Martin Luther is doing this for his grandpa, wants to make sure he's out of purgatory. And these stairs are said to have come from Jerusalem and they're uh, from Pilate's Praetorium and, and where Jesus was tried at and they, they shipped him over to Rome. And so in, in 1510, he's crawling up on his knees saying the Our Fathers and halfway up, he hears this voice within his heart that says the just will live by faith. And right then and there, it sparks this change in the trajectory of his life, and he becomes what we call uh, one of the Protestant reformers, protesting things that saying you have to work your way to God and saying it's all about Jesus. And he starts a movement, becomes an enemy of, of the universal church at that time. But I'm thankful for it, and you should be too if you're a Christ follower, uh, for guys like him that stood up and said, we live by faith, not by what we do. And so we go into Paul, and Paul said this years, years and years, years, 1,500 years before uh, Luther would, would come to that realization. In Ephesians chapter 2, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself, right? It is the gift of God, uh, not, not by you so that no one can boast. Uh, it, it's his understanding. And then it goes on to say we're the workmanship of God created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Some versions say you're his masterpiece. And yeah, you're going to do good works, but it's because you're saved by grace. Grace is getting what we don't deserve, right? You and I deserve hell. That's what we deserve. Uh, the, the punishment for our sins is to be hell. That's where we're supposed to go. We're supposed to pay for our own sins because we have broken that relationship with God. We've gone our own way. And, and yet God says, I don't want you to go to hell. I'm providing a way out for you to go to hell. I'm giving you something you don't deserve. I'm giving you payment for your sins, which was Jesus dying on the cross. And the Bible says that all of us that believe that receive that and live for that, we are then forgiven. Our sins are paid. We no longer have to go to hell. We get to be with him forever in heaven. It's a beautiful transaction that cost him everything. And so as Luther heard this, as Paul said this, as we see what Jesus says in verse 28 here, he says, come to me and I will give you rest. Jesus says, I will give you. He doesn't say, come to me and then earn it. He doesn't say, come to me and then do this. He says, come to me. And I will give you rest because he was the one who made that path back to God possible. It's about what was done on the cross that brings us back to God, not what we do. You're like, wait a minute, Jeff, you're saying I can say yes to Jesus and then, and then all of a sudden I'm just good? No. If you say yes to Jesus, you're going to understand that you're in a, you're in a relationship and you're going to love him back for the love that he showed by taking your place. It's not about what we do. It's about what was done. Every other religion and even some that call themselves Christian, they work on you got to do this, 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 this to be okay with God. There's nothing you or I can do to be good enough to be okay with God. But through his grace, he gives us Jesus. And if you've never made this decision, I want to encourage you to text the word follow to the number on the screen. We'd love to talk to you about what it means to follow Jesus because it's not about rules and it's not about going to church. It's not about uh, making sure that you're, you're reading the right passage of the Bible every day. It's about relationship. It's about relationship. You know, as you think about your relationships in life, I'm, I'm married and I have kids. And yet we had to sign a, for a marriage a license to make sure it was legal in the eyes of the law. And, uh, but, you know, when I signed that marriage license, there wasn't a bunch of things that said, uh, you will kiss your wife goodnight, you will, you will say I love you, you will go on dates, you'll remember your anniversary, you'll do all these things. That, that wasn't some contractual thing that I signed when I married Jennifer. 
I stood on the stage and I said, I do, meaning I love her and I'm going to lay down my life for her. It's not a contract. It's a relationship. That's the same way with us and God through Jesus. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. When we had kids, you know, when we checked out of the hospital, they didn't give us a, something that we had to sign saying, I will feed them, I will clothe them, uh, I will shelter them. I, I, I wish people would understand that before uh, they, they have kids, right? But we've done that with all four of our kids because we love them. Not because we signed some contract, but we have a relationship with them. I love them. I wish every parent would do that, and we wouldn't have 400,000 kids in foster care in our country right now. So people would step up and do what they're called to do in a love relationship. So as Jesus says, come to me, and I will give you rest, there's a couple things that we can learn from him. Next, he says, take my yoke, right? Which ultimately, let me put it in layman's terms, he says, let me lead, let me lead you. Take my yoke. See, a lot of people like Jesus from the salvation side. Woo, I'm saved. All right, he took my sins away. But we have to understand there's a, uh, there's a two-pronged approach here. There's salvation from Savior, but then there's the lordship of him being our boss. And this is the lordship part. This is where he says, let me lead. Take my yoke upon you. Now, when you hear yoke, some of you might be thinking there's an L in there. There is not. Right? I'm not talking about what's in an egg. I'm talking about a yoke for oxen, right? And so if you're, if you're not of the uh, farming, um, I have a barn on my property, so I'm kind of a pro at this. Uh, got two goats in there watching for some friends, but that's about it, and two dogs. Uh, you can have them. But as we, we talk about the yoke, what it is, is it, it, it's this wooden tool. It's a farming tool uh, that it has the arch shapes, and you put it on the back of oxen, and, and then the person who owns the oxen, the person who's plowing the field, controls them as they pull the plow, right? And so, so yoke is kind of, uh, hey, let the person who's in charge lead you. You say, is, is Jesus comparing us to oxen? He's given us a great demonstration of what it means to be led by him. Let me lead you. Take my yoke upon you. Some yokes were burdensome and they hurt the animals. Jesus says, mine's not. It, it, it's easy, and my burden is light. And so he says, take my yoke upon you. Let me lead you. Surrender to the Lord your mind. Let me direct your steps. And in Psalm 23, we know that uh, David's talking about the, uh, the good shepherd, right? And, and, and he says, the Lord's my shepherd. I shall not be in want. And then in verse 2 and 3, he says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He, he guides me along the right path for his name's sake. Fast forward, that, that's Jesus. That's Jesus for us. He guides us along the right path for his name's sake. Not for my glory, not for my comfort, but for his name's sake. I'm going to be led by him, by the yoke that he puts on. One of my favorite worship songs out there today is uh, Follow You Anywhere. And there's some lyrics in it that says, You make it easy to love you. You are good and you are kind. You bring joy into my life. You make it easy to trust you. You have never left my side. You've been faithful every time. All I want is you, Jesus. All I want is you. You are the refuge I run to. You are the fire that leads me through the night. I'll follow you anywhere. There's a million reasons to trust you. Nothing to fear for you are by my side. I'll follow you anywhere. Oh, Jesus, you came to my rescue, took my place upon that cross. You redeemed what I had lost. Now my whole world revolves around you. You're the center of my life. You're the treasure. You're the prize. When you see Jesus like that, when you see him as the prize, the treasure, you, you say, I will follow you anywhere, even into places that are uncomfortable, that I don't necessarily want to go, but I know this is where you're sending me. And that's what we're supposed to do. We're to let him lead. We're to let him lead. You ever had one of these you guys, some of you are like, well, I don't know exactly what that is yet, Jeff. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you. But this is something we use around my house, and it's, a, uh, it's, it's called a moving harness. But it's the best example that I have at my place for what a yoke would be like, right? And so as, as, as you put this on, someone puts it on, on on the other side. They'd put it on there. And you can move some amazingly heavy stuff with this without much effort, 
which is good. And I know you're thinking, Jeff, with your physique, you probably can move everything by yourself, but just go with me for the illustration. So, so uh, you know, if there's a huge refrigerator, a huge armoire, whatever we got to move, uh, we put the strap underneath, and then we, we sit here together, and at the same time, we lift up, and we're able to move this massive, heavy object with ease. You kind of guide it with your hands as you walk, and, and you can go. It, it, it's beautiful, and it's this great picture of what Jesus is talking about here with the yoke. You know, he, he's done all the heavy work. He is the connecting point, but we're to let him lead. I think this is a side note, but I think that's uh, why Paul uses this illustration uh, when he talks about marriage, and he says that uh, we should not be unequally yoked. And what he's saying by that is Christians and non-Christians should not get married. A Christian should not marry a non-Christian. A non-Christian should not marry a Christian. Because you know when that doesn't work well? It's when you're on different levels. When you're on different levels, it's, it doesn't work. You have, to, you have to really, you have to do all the, all the work in that. And when you're a Christian, non-Christian, you're just on different levels. You're living for different things. But Jesus wants us to come under his yoke where we're on the same level. We're saved by him, living for him, trying to honor him with our life. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus says this, whoever wants to be my disciple, whoever's going to be yoked to me, as we talk about in our context today, must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Uh, Okay, put on the straps, put on the, the, the yoke on you, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. What does that mean? It means if you want to have rest and you want to have eternity, you will lose your life for me. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. Right? So if you save, if you try to live your life for yourself, you're going to lose it in eternity. But if you, if you lose your life for him, you'll, you'll be saved forever. That's, that's what Jesus is saying here. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Jesus says, follow me. And it may be tough at times, but it's going to be worth it now and for eternity. You will be saved now and forever. But if you make it about yourself and you just want to do what you want to do, you're forfeiting your soul. And it's not going to be well in the end. I got done reading this book a, a while back by J.D. Greer called What Are You Going to Do With Your Life? It tells a story of a, a, a pastor at a, at a conference in May of 2000. Uh, 40,000 college students were there. And he, he's struggling and, and the wind's blowing and he, and he feels like he's supposed to tell this story. So he says, Three weeks ago, we got word at our church that Ruby Leison and Laura Edwards had both been killed in Cameroon. Ruby was over 80, single all her life. She poured it out for one great thing, to make Jesus known among the unchurched, the poor, and the sick. Laura was a widow, a medical doctor, pushing 80 years old and serving at Ruby's side in Cameroon. The brakes failed, the car went over the cliff, and they were both killed instantly. And I asked, my people, was this a tragedy? And the students responded, no, emphatically. No, the preacher echoed, that is a glory. I'll tell you what is a tragedy. He then pulled out a page from Reader's Digest. And if you don't know what that is, just ask your parents. (laughs) Pulled out a page from Reader's Digest and read, Bob and Penny took early retirement from their jobs in the Northeast five years ago when he was 59 and she was 51. Now they live in Punta Gorda, Florida, where they cruise on their 30-foot boat, play softball, and collect shells. He said, the American dream... Come to the end of your life, your one and only life, and let the last great work before you give an account to your creator be, I collected shells. See my shells? That's a tragedy. People today are spending billions of dollars to persuade you to embrace that tragic dream. He said, and I get 40 minutes to plead with you. Don't buy it. Don't waste your life. That was John Piper in a message. I'm a little jealous because he got 40 minutes and I only get 32 minutes, but that's another story. Or fast forward. Can I tell you, I've had to admit something the last couple of years that I, I never wanted to admit, and I'm kind of ashamed to admit, but I know it's true, so I've got to admit it to you. Tom Brady is the best quarterback to ever play in the NFL. <laughs> ah. Oh, hush. He is. But he doesn't know Jesus. I know that from things he said, and I know that from practices he does before games and after games and different things. That, uh, uh, but here, here, after he had won three Super Bowls, And I know he's won more since. It's not part of the story. (laughs) He was on 60 Minutes, and he was asked by Steve Croft in an interview. He said, this whole upward trajectory, what have you learned about yourself? 
And Tom Brady, the greatest quarterback ever in the NFL, more Super Bowl trophies, all that stuff. He said, why do I have three Super Bowl rings and still think there's something greater out there for me? I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, hey, man, this is what it is. I reach my goal, my dream, my life. Me, I think, God, it's got to be more than this. And what else is there for me? Croft asked, what's the answer? Brady smiled for a moment, then the smile faded. I wish I knew, he said. I wish I knew. Pinnacle in so many ways uh, of something that young boys aspire to be and is lost, but has rings and Super Bowl trophies, seashells. Oh, it'll be for us when we come into eternity. What have we been striving for? Trophies and seashells and things that rust and decay and thieves break in and steal or things that matter for eternity. Jesus saying, let me lead. Uh, Give up your life for me. Follow me. When we understand that he has saved us, we should be willing to follow him wherever he calls us to, even if that takes us to places of of very, very uh, uncomfortable situations and an uncomfortable life. Where are you following Jesus? And then last thing I think he says here in in, uh, this is learn from me, right? He says, and learn from me for I'm gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Not only are we to let him lead, when he says come to me, we need to let him lead, uh, but we're to follow the character he displayed. And here he talks about his heart being humble and gentle. The only time where he he self-describes his own heart, he says, uh, you know, I'm humble and gentle. That's how I live my life and I want you to, to follow after me. Learn from me. In Philippians 2, we, uh, we see it where it said, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility consider others above yourselves, not looking for your own interests, but to the interests of others. And your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but used to his own advantage. So we're to learn from him. We're to live life like him. We're to love like he did. My son Eli, he's at... Uh, uh, <coughs> Kansas State, going to school, and he, he called me this past week, FaceTimed me the other day. It was uh, around lunchtime. I was in the office, and, and he FaceTimed me, and he was showing me what was going on on the campus of K-State this week, and there were hundreds of students gathered around this lady preaching, which sometimes you'd be like, all right, someone's telling about Jesus, but this lady, and I've looked up her stuff, and she's just, she's just off the reservation. Her, her name is Sister Cindy. And Sister Cindy goes around to college campuses, and she, and I apologize if this is rough wordage, um, and if you have explained something later, I apologize, uh, but she goes around on what she calls her slut-shaming tour. And she's going around to colleges and calling out girls for what they're wearing, calling out girls for what they're doing. And, 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 and the college community has just taken her in because it's more about getting your picture or a TikTok or, or a Snapchat with her and all this stuff. It's kind of trendy. But she's going on these campuses, and I've seen what she says to these college students. I'm just like, no, no, no. That's not what we want people to think of when they think of Jesus people. That's like Westboro Baptist up in Topeka. That's not gentle and humble like Jesus. And too often, church, we become like that. We become so judgmental of people that are different than us. We become so judgmental of people who we know are not on the path to heaven. And we're just like, they're going to hell. And we, we don't care. That's who Jesus cared about. That's who he wanted to go after. The religious leaders who thought they had it all together, Jesus called them all kinds of names. He says, hey, learn from me. Be gentle and humble in your heart. Care for others. It's not about what we do on Sunday, because we can come here on a Sunday, we can be all smiles and hugs and, hey, everything's good. What about Monday through Saturday? What do people say about the way you talk, the way you act, the way you treat Learn from me, Jesus said. And if we take Jesus up on this invitation and we let him lead and we learn from him, uh, there's some expectations that we can have according to what Jesus says. Here's the promise we receive, right? He's saying if you do this two times in this passage, he mentions rest, which means it's pretty important. If we do this, we can find rest now, right? In the now, we don't have to wait till heaven. We can find rest now, meaning, meaning peace, meaning fulfillment, 
meaning I don't have to work uh, and make sure that I'm walking the right way or eating the right things in order to be okay with God. I'm okay because of Jesus. And there's, there's a peace that can come over me that I don't have to work my way to heaven. Jesus made it possible for me. And so there's this rest now. This rest definition, the first definition of rest says it's the cessation from action, motion, labor, or exertion. Jesus is saying, you no longer have to uh, just, just exert yourself so much trying to climb the stairs on your knees in order to get to God or in order to get somebody else to God. We can find rest now. Now, this peace and this rest doesn't mean that everything's going to be easy. Man, we know that. Jesus in John 16, 33 says, uh, he says that we're going to have trouble in this world, right? He says, I've told you these things so that, uh, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you're going to have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And he says, yeah, there may be tough times, but, but have peace, have this rest, know that you're secure in me. Paul pushes on a little farther with that in 2 Corinthians 4, 8, and 9, where he says, We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. Folks, some of us in this room, some of us watching online are going through some tough times. We're in valleys. We're in deserts. You have some physical uh, things that are going on. You have family members with things going on. You have financial things going on. You have relational things going on. You have temptation battles that you're struggling through. Following Jesus, he's done all the heavy lifting, but we still have to, have to work on, on, on guiding that and letting him lead us. Remember, he's, he's, he's taken the thing for us. We need to have his yoke upon us and find that rest now. And then we can find that rest forever. Right? We can find that rest forever. Jesus came to set us free and to be forgiven now, but he overcame the grave so that we can be free forever and we can be with God. We can have that peace, that rest that comes being in relationship with him. He came to overcome death and to give us that option to find rest forever. Hebrews chapter 4, we're not going to get into it, but it's a whole passage on how we're to enter this, uh, the, this promised land. We're to enter this spiritual rest like the, the Israelites. God was giving them the promised land, and they were hard-hearted, and they didn't go. But for us, uh, we're supposed to enter this spiritual rest with God forever and eternity because of Jesus and not harden our hearts. In Revelation 21... Towards the end of the Bible, John's given the revelation, and he says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Folks, if you are a Christ follower and you're not looking forward to that, there is something wrong. Check your spiritual pulse because it's dead. I mean, that right there, when you read that, you should be like, yes, that's what I want. That's what I'm living for. Oh, I like you. You're good. I, I love my family. But I would much rather be there forever, understanding that. And we need to understand that rest that we have now and forever and be passing that on to others and telling them that, that, that we would long to tell them that. There's a movie many of you have probably seen, Braveheart, right? It, it's not historically totally accurate, including the speech at the end. But William Wallace is rallying the troops of Scotland against, uh, against the king of England in the 13th century. And he has this great speech as he's going, and he's riding back and forth on his horse, and he's telling them, you may die. <laughs> yeah. And he goes on, he says, well, they could take our lives, but they can never take our freedom. Right? Terrible impersonation. Just go with it. Go with the words, not the impersonation. He says, they may take our lives, but they can't take our freedom. And that's not necessarily what was said in that battle, but it was great in the movie. But that line should ring true in our lives as well. Man, they can take anything from me, but they can't take my Jesus. They can't take my rest. They can't take my home in heaven. Regardless of what comes, we have that. And too many of us are living life like we're defeated already. Man, we have the greatest hope 
in the world in Jesus. May people see that by the way we treat them, by the way that we're led, and may they see that in the hope that we have for eternity. Let's be faithful, church. Father, I thank you for this great word from Jesus, this invitation to come to him. Lord, to follow, to be led by him, and to learn from him and be like him. I pray we would do that. Father, I pray that you would be with us as a church to show the world that hope. And for anybody in here who doesn't have it, may today be the day where they say, I want that freedom. I want that peace and rest forever. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.